Joint situations are one of the three main conceptual pillars of category theory, the others being representables and limit-co-limit constructions. We motivate our discussion by observing that comparisons of objects in a category is done by looking at the morphisms between them. So for example, the following diagram demonstrates that A is isomorphic to B. We see that in a category, diagrams either commute or they don't. There is no other relationship. In other words, equality is the only comparison between morphisms. On the other hand, comparisons of categories are done by functors, but we can also compare functors by natural transformations. So in a similar diagram to the one above, by replacing objects by categories and morphisms by functors, we have diagrams that may or may not commute, and we also have ways to transform functors. For example, the identity functor on B may not be equal to GF, but there may be a way to transform it via eta to gf. In other words, functors can be compared in other ways. The situation above is an isomorphism between objects, which is nearly as good as saying that a is the same as b. It is in some sense the correct notion of sameness in a category. We also have the notion of isomorphism between categories, but it is usually too strict a concept. It suggests sameness is up to equality, or at least just a one-to-one -one mapping of the structures involved. But since there exist ways to compare functors, we see that there is a better notion of sameness. We say that the category A is equivalent to the category B via the functors F and G as above, if and only if the natural transformations eta and epsilon are natural isomorphisms. The merit of this definition is that equivalent categories are essentially the same, meaning sameness is up to isomorphism and not just equality. We can relax the notion of equivalence further to that of an adjoint situation. We say that F is left adjoint to G via these natural transformations eta and epsilon if and only if the natural transformations eta and epsilon, called the unit and co-unit respectively, satisfy the following axioms. First, that epsilon fb, f eta b is equal to the identity on fb for each b object b, and also that g epsilon a, eta g a, is equal to the identity g a for each a object a. These identities are called the triangle identities for the joint situation. We hope you will realize by the many examples in mathematics that joint situations are the next best thing after equivalence. And note that all equivalences are joint situations, and furthermore the relation is reflexive, meaning that if f and g are an equivalence, then f is left adjoint to g, and g is left adjoint to f. We will see that adjoint situations can be understood by a variety of perspectives. We will need the following definitions before we show the equivalent formulations. We begin by the definition of the category f over a. Its objects consist of amorphisms g from fb to a, which we also denote by b comma g comma a, and a morphism from g to g prime consists of a b morphism k and an a morphism m such that fk followed by g prime is equal to g followed by m. We denote this morphism also by the following. Note that there is a forgetful functor from f over a to the product of b and a where the object b g a gets sent to b a and the morphism km to km. There is a completely similar definition for the category b over g. We will skip its presentation, but you may pause the video if you want to see the details. We now come to the main result of this section. Given functors f from the category b to a and g from the category a to b, the following are equivalent. One, that f and g are in a joint situation where f is left adjoint to g via eta and epsilon. Two, for all objects A and B, there exists this isomorphism of HOM sets from the HOM set of morphisms in A to the HOM set in B, and also this is natural in A and B. Three, there exists an isomorphism of functors from F over A to B over G, which respects the forgetful functors to the product of B and A which means that the diagram here commutes. Let's first prove that one implies two. We define the set map phi to take an amorphism G to the composite in B of the unit A to B followed by GG. For its inverse psi, we take a B morphism F to FF followed by the co-unit epsilon A. We can verify these are isomorphisms by naturality of the unit and co-unit and by using the triangle identities of the joint situation. We have phi psi, of f equaling a to b followed by g f f followed by g epsilon a. We can make a substitution of f followed by a to g a 
for eta b followed by g f f by naturality of eta. But eta g a followed by g epsilon a is the identity on g a by the triangle identity. So we get back f. Looking at psi phi on g gives us f a to b followed by f g g followed by epsilon a and f a to b followed by epsilon f b being the identity by the triangle identity, we see that we get back g. Therefore, phi is an isomorphism of sets. We have left to show that phi is natural in the components a and b. If we're given an amorphism p and using subscripts in our notation above, we need to verify the following commutes where the left map is the post composition by P and the right map is the post composition by GP. Given an amorphism G from FB to A, we take the low road and end up with GPG A to B. The high road gives us GPGG A to B, then since functors preserve composition, we have equality. For naturality in B, we need to show that for a B morphism Q, the following diagram commutes where the left map is pre-composition by FQ and the right map is pre-composition by Q. Then taking G along the high road gives us GG A to B Q and the low road G on G FQ A to B. But by naturality of the unit A to, we can make the following substitution, which shows equality. Therefore, phi is natural in A and B. So one implies two is done. Next, let's prove two implies three. Let's define big phi by taking an object BGA to b little phi g a and a morphism km to km. Note that phi respects the forgetful functors by this definition. But is it a well-defined functor? Preservation of composition and identity is clear, but if we are given a morphism km in f over b, is km a morphism between the objects b little phi g a to b prime little phi g prime a prime? I made a mistake here, so we need to proceed with a correction. We want to show that if km from g to g prime is a f over a morphism, then km from little phi g to little phi g prime is a b over g morphism. In other words, that this square commutes. We are given that the isomorphism little phi is natural in the component b, so the pre-composition map of fk and of k makes the following diagram commute. Then given g prime, the low road gives us little phi on g prime fk, but g prime fk is equal to mg by the green square above. So this is equal to little phi mg. Then the high road gives us little phi mg is equal to little phi g prime k. Since little phi is also natural in A, this square commutes with post composition maps of m and gm. So let's take g. The low road gives us little phi on mg, which as we showed before is equal to little phi g prime k. The high road gives us gm little phi g. So the purple square above does in fact commute. Therefore, big phi is well defined. By symmetry, we define psi to take an object b f a to b little phi inverse f a and morphisms km to km. By the same reasoning for big phi, this is well defined. Since big phi and big psi are identical on morphisms to show big phi is an isomorphism, it is enough to show big phi is an isomorphism on objects. But this is clear since little phi is an isomorphism. Therefore, big phi is an isomorphism. And as we mentioned before, the, the commutativity of the triangle in the condition is by the definition of the functor big phi. So two implies three is done. Finally, we prove three implies one. We define a to b to be big phi on the identity of f b for each b object b. And we define epsilon a to be big phi inverse of the identity on G A for each A object A. We need to verify that these define natural transformations. Given a B morphism Q, we need to show that the following diagram commutes. But this diagram is equal to phi acting on the morphism in F over A between the objects of the identity on FB to the identity on FB prime. Therefore, since big phi is a functor, the diagram commutes. Similarly, given an A morphism P, the naturality of epsilon depends on showing that the diagram here commutes. But this is equal to big phi inverse on the morphism on the left in B over G. Therefore, eta and epsilon are natural transformations. Finally, we need to verify the triangle identities of an adjoint situation. Note that since big phi is an isomorphism, we have big phi on epsilon FB, F eta B, 
is equal to big phi on the identity of fb, which by definition is a to b. Then the first equality holds if and only if epsilon fb, f a to b is equal to the identity on fb, which is one of the triangle identities. And similarly, big phi inverse on g epsilon a, a to g a is equal to big phi inverse on the identity of g a, which is equal to epsilon a by definition, and that first equality is true if and only if g epsilon a, a to g a, is equal to the identity on g a, which is the other triangle identity. For one, this diagram trivially commutes, and thus is a morphism in f over a. So we may now apply the functor big phi to obtain the following commuting diagram. Note big phi epsilon f b is equal to the identity on g f b, by our definition of the co-unit. Also recall that big phi is the identity on morphisms, so it takes a to b on the identity of b to the a to b on the identity of b on the right. Therefore, big phi epsilon f b f a to b is equal to a to b, which is what we wanted to show. Case two is entirely similar, so we will skip it, but you may pause the video if you would like the details. Therefore, the triangle identities hold, and thus f is left adjoint to g, which finishes the proof.